welcome to Medical Dialogues, your daily dose of health and medical news. I'm Mr. Zaman and here is what I bring to you all from the world of medicine. How few exercises cause fatigue and affects cognitive function. Certain physically demanding activities are performed at high altitude or in other low oxygen environments. Excellent coordination, judgment and decision making are important. In some cases, such as when mountaineering, these capabilities may be the difference between life and death. Low blood oxygen levels were found to be the distinguishing factor that affected executive control related neural activity and cognitive performance when exercise was performed in low oxygen conditions. In a study published this month in scientific reports, researchers at the University of Tsukuba showed that reductions in neural activity in brain regions responsible for executive control related cognitive functions and cognitive performance during exercise in low oxygen conditions could be prevented by maintaining oxygen saturation. Researchers demonstrated casualty that the decreases in neural activity and performance are caused by a low oxygen availability to the brain tissue. It was not straightforward because of the complexity exhibited by the brain and all its functions. Researchers compared the effects of hypoxic conditions in which blood oxygen level is reduced with those in which blood oxygen levels remain stable during exercise. By doing this, they isolated low oxygen saturation as a factor for decreased neural activity and decreased performance. Neural activity in the prefrontal cortex was measured with functional near-infrared spectroscopy to show change in oxygenated hemoglobin, that is, oxygen usage from regional blood supply. Cognitive performance was assessed using Stroop interference, which is the difference in completion time or number of errors between neutral and incongruent trials. In incongruent trials, the color of the text must be identified when, for example, the word red is written in green. In neutral trials, only the color of a swatch must be identified. The study suggests that oxygen supply is important for maintaining cognitive function during exercise in low oxygen environments. Furthermore, regions of the brain with newer, that is from an evolutionary point of view, less critical functions may be lower priority than those responsible for functions that keep us alive. Thus, the effects of cognitive fatigue must be taken into account when physical activities that require judgment and critical thinking are performed in low oxygen environments new growing concern where typhoid evades all antibiotics and needs immediate attention. The bacteria that causes typhoid fever is becoming increasingly resistant to common antibiotics used to treat the disease, with resistant strains spreading to hundreds of countries in the past three decades, new analysis shows. The study published in the Lancet Microbe shows how resistant strains originally from South Asia, where the disease burden is highest, have spread to other countries 200 times since 1990. To isolate the drug-resistant typhoid strains, the researchers performed genome sequencing on 3489S typhi candidates obtained from blood samples collected between 2014 and 2019 from people in Bangladesh, India, Nepal and Pakistan with confirmed cases of typhoid fever. For comparison, they sequenced another 4169S typhi samples collected from 70 countries between 1905 and 2018. Findings show that resistant S typhi strains have spread between countries at least 197 times since 1990 with strains that are often occurred in South Asia and Southeast Asia, East and Southern Africa spreading to countries including the United States, the UK and Canada. Researchers also compared strains showing resistant to macrolides and quinolones, which are considered the most critically important human antibiotics. Typhoid strains resistant to quinolones, a class of antibiotics that act against a wide range of disease-causing bacteria, have risen and spread at least 94 times since 1990, with most, that is 97%, originating from South Asia, according to the study. As a result, we need not think of typhoid as a problem in certain countries or regions, but rather a global problem that requires a global response. That includes funding for surveillance and typhoid vaccines. One of the challenges with addressing typhoid is the lack of reliable diagnostics. Blood cultures require sophisticated laboratory infrastructure, are expensive, take two to five days for results and miss 40% of cases. As a consequence, many people with fever are treated with antibiotics for suspected typhoid when they do not actually have the disease fueling drug resistance, ended the authors. 
how basic things like drawing can help in diagnosing dementia. Changes in drawing traits have been reported in people with early stage cognitive impairments, but most studies have used a single drawing task only. In a study published recently in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, researchers have found that they could classify people with normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease with much greater accuracy by combining traits extracted from five different drawing tasks than by using just one or two tasks. The researchers used five different drawing tests that captured different aspects of cognition and are commonly used when diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. While these tests were being performed, 22 different drawing features relating to pen pressure, pen posture, speed and pauses were automatically analyzed per test. The researchers then compared these features with scores from seven different tests of cognitive function and used a computer-based program to see how well the drawing traits could be used to identify people with normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. Surprised by how well the combination of drawing traits extracted from multiple tasks worked by capturing different complementary aspects of cognitive impairments, said the researchers. The three-group classification accuracy of all five tests was 75.2%, which was almost 10% better than that of any of the tests by themselves. In addition, the majority of the drawing features that were different between the three groups had greater changes between the normal and Alzheimer's disease subjects compared with the normal and mild cognitive impairment subjects. This is important because mild cognitive impairment is often considered as an early and less severe form of Alzheimer's disease. Although this was a relatively small study, the results are encouraging. These results paved the way for better screening tests for cognitive impairments, the researchers concluded. Developmental Changes in Preterm Babies A study in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, published by Elsevier, reports that among very preterm-born children, subgroups can be distinguished with distinct outcome profiles that vary in severity, type and combination of deficits. Children born very preterm, that is after a pregnancy duration of less than 32 weeks, have a higher risk for difficulties during development than peers who are born after a normal pregnancy duration. Now, what kind of difficulties and to what degree, however, varies strongly from child to child. Nevertheless, very preterm born children are usually considered as one group. According to the new research, their findings suggested that the population of very preterm born children could be divided into four subgroups, each within a different profile of developmental outcomes. Almost half of the children, that is 45%, belonged to a subgroup of children who had no difficulties and functioned at similar levels as their full term born peers. However, 55% of the children belonged to one of the three subgroups with suboptimal developmental outcomes. The first subgroup consisted of children who primarily had difficulties in motor and cognitive functioning, whereas the second group of children primarily had difficulties in behavior, emotions, and social relationships. A small subgroup of children had more severe impairments in all domains of development. The researchers were also interested to know the predictors of these developmental outcomes. They found that children in the three subgroups with suboptimal outcome profiles were more often boys or had parents with a lower level of education or with a non-European migration background. Children who were diagnosed with prematurity-related lung disease, that is bronchopulmonary dysplasia, also had a higher risk of suboptimal developmental outcomes. Authors concluded that new insights are highly needed for very preterm-born children. Preterm birth rates are increasing as are survival rates, especially among the most immature infants who have the highest risk for impairments. Thus, the number of very preterm born children with impairments growing up in our societies is rising. These impairments generally persist when children get older and there is currently little evidence in support of interventions that meaningfully improve long-term outcomes. These insights may be used to tailor support programs to the specific needs of subgroups of children to improve their effectiveness. That's all for today. Stay tuned to Medical Dialogues for latest updates. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe and press the bell icon.